Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for every breath that we have in our lungs. We thank you for all of the good things that we have. And Lord, we thank you for your word, that we can know you, that we can learn about you, and that through your word and the power of your spirit, that we can be changed, to be more like Christ. We do pray that today you'd be working in us, that we would be growing and learning about you, being renewed in our minds, um, but also being changed uh, in the way that we live our lives and in the desires of our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Anybody remember what we're studying, where we are? Yeah. What? And throw man. Um, yeah, that's part of it. Um, what does what what does anthro man mean to us? Man, man. Yes, anthro is a prefix that means man. Um, but how does that pertain to anything? Yeah, worldview. Yeah. So um, anthro or what you believe about mankind, people, is an intricate element. Intricate, not intricate. Can be intricate. Intricate. Me- integral, Whew, rough start, <laughs> integral part of any worldview. So everybody has a view of man. They believe certain things to be true about human beings. So you could be drawing on the Bible for your view of man. You could be drawing on your intuition uh, for your view of man. Or you could be drawing on some other source of worldview or philosophy. Um, right. What are some other parts of worldview? Yeah. You and then you. Theology? Which means, yeah, your view of God um, or your view of there not being a God. So, again, this is something that everybody has. Um, even if you have a negative theology, it is still a theology. Um, your, your basic ideas about the world are going to be shaped about whether or not you believe in a God or what you believe about that God. Whether it's the God of the Bible, um, no God, a God who doesn't interfere in the world, or maybe some sort of just ultimate principle or supreme power. Um, but everybody has one of these. What else? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but you still gave an answer. Awesome. Okay. So salvation. Um, I don't need to go that far. And I heard somebody say knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge. Um, so knowledge, I'm not going to write one. That's, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but quest, like ideas that come under this are whether or not you believe that there's ultimate truth or how do you know that our reason can teach us anything about the universe or can we actually learn through our senses? How is that possible? Um, how do we come to gain knowledge and can we come to know true knowledge or is it all relative um, to each one of us? And then salvation, um, everybody believes that there's something wrong with the world or that there's not. Um, and so... The what's wrong with the world would fall under salvation, but also how can it then be fixed? So in the biblical worldview, we believe sin is the main problem, the sin in human hearts, and that can only be fixed through Christ, him living a perfect life on our behalf, paying for our sins, um, and then joining us to himself into a new life, a a recreation. Some people think we need to tear down government systems because those are what's wrong with the world. There's all sorts of answers to this. Some people think it's pain and suffering um, or even your idea of your own individuality. Other groups. Did I really? Oh, there's room in there for an E. Good try. Um, Not eschatology, but ethics. Yes. What do you point? Yes. The music stand has to go somewhere. Um, is it anybody's view here? James, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to move you're gonna have to move your thing. What? This board is broken. We'll switch them next time. Um, okay. So ethics. What is ethics? What are ethics? Morals, um, your code of right and wrong. This is uh, what's right and wrong. How do you know right and wrong? Is there ultimate right and wrong? Um, Why is it bad to do bad things? Why is it good to do good things? Um, That's going to be ethics. Okay. 
does this have to do with what we've been talking about? Yes. Yeah, so um, this is all a framework from which to do evangelism. Um, the main thing we've been talking about the last few weeks, several weeks now, um, has been evangelism, sharing the gospel with people. Um, and the reason we're talking about worldview is because we want to be able to speak the gospel into people's lives in their context. Um, the Bible was written in a certain context, and we want to understand that context so we can understand the truth in the Bible, and then we want to communicate it in a way that can be understood. Um, if I was going to somebody, like Paul went to the Greeks in Athens, which we're going to finish up our discussion of that tonight, um, and say they had no knowledge of the Bible. Say they live somewhere like California. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, imagine somebody who, and this is a growing group who literally know nothing about the Bible in America. Um, and this is true about all places in the world. If I were to go to that person and I were to say, they were like, hey, what do you believe about the world and God? And I were to say the Apostles' Creed. Would that work? Why not? Yeah, wh how, do we, how does it start? That's it. Close. Close. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. This is why we have somebody lead from up front, because it kind of falls apart. Yeah, yeah, okay. So just, just think about all of those phrases. Um, a creed functions very well for distinguishing whether or not somebody believes the things that you believe, given the knowledge that you have. So we use creeds to distinguish who's in the church and who's outside the church. Um, we say we believe all of these things in the church with the understanding that we're either going to explain those things or they've already been explained, and you're affirming that, yes, I do believe these things. Um, but there's all sorts of terminology in there that if you had no understanding of the Bible, no concept of the God of the Bible would make no sense to you. God the Father Almighty. Well, who's that, and how? in what sense is he our Father? Um, who's Jesus Christ? Why is he dying? Um, he was raised again. That seems odd. You know, who's Pontius Pilate? What does he have to do with it? Who's Mary? You know, there's, there's a lot of things in there. Um, what's hell? That wouldn't make sense to somebody. So what we're doing with this worldview discussion is saying we want to tap into the basic beliefs that everybody has and use those to point them to gospel truth. Um, so the Bible speaks about all of these different categories because um, there's a worldview that comes along with the Bible. Um, it just happens to be the correct worldview. And we've been articulating that in sort of a condensed form. Um, does anybody remember the parts of that? The, the gospel story. Creation. What's the last one? What's the last one? Glorification. Okay. And who can tell me what these things are? What does the Bible say about creation? Out of nothing, good, God did it. Um, it's very good. That is true. Yes. The, what is what is meant by it is very good is perfection, and there's actually all sorts of um, linguistic tools that are used in the first part of Genesis that mean perfection. We're going to be talking about that more um, on Sunday morning. Um, yeah, so out of nothing, God did it. What about the fall? We did it, not God. There was a serpent. Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a sin nature um, that's involved in this. Um, what caused evil in the world is not God, is, is not some outside force. 
um, what caused all the evil in the world is the sin in human hearts, um, is, is wrong desires. And ever since the first two people sinned, now everybody gets that sin nature. And the world has also come under a curse. And now, if you want to answer the question of what's wrong with the world, um, happened in the fall, right? Um, if you want to know about creation, where did everything come from? The first cause is God, right? Okay, what about redemption? What do we believe about it? Yeah. God did it. That's important. Christ saves us. Yeah. Um, anything else? I mean, Jesus is the answer to this question, um, but more specifically that he. You said that so aggressively. <laughs> um, all right, all right. That was scary for me, too. Let's move on. Um, yeah, so specifically, we believe that God came, or God, Jesus came. Um, Jesus is also God, so I wasn't wrong there. Jesus comes as the second Adam in the sense that he fulfills the covenant that Adam was supposed to fulfill, um, and that he lives a perfect life of obedience before God. And then he dies for all of our failure to keep the covenant, for all of our sin, sin against the person of God. Um, but also, it doesn't end there. It's not like we get a clean slate, and that's it. We're also joined to him, um, which means we get his inheritance, and we're adopted into the family of God. And what's more is that then we're going to be part of this recreation process that's begun now in every believer and in this world in God's kingdom, and it's going to be brought into a fullness at some point, which brings us to glorification. Um, the kingdom that has come and is coming will be coming in fullness when Jesus returns, and everything's going to be made new. And everybody who is following after Christ is going to be in perfect relationship with God um, in a perfectly good, very good new creation um, of, away from the effects of the fall. Uh, but there's a, another side to this. What else happens at that stage? It's important for people to know. There's a lot of good stuff. Well, if you don't believe in Jesus, um, if you're not part of the the kingdom that has come and is coming, if you're if you're not relying on Christ and trusting in Him, following after Him, um, well, then the opposite is going to be true. Instead of being part of the new creation you're going to be permanently separated from everything that was ever good, that you're still getting the benefits from in this life. Um, we call that place hell. Yeah, so that's the, the story in a nutshell, and it touches on all of these worldview issues. And our discussion um, from the last couple weeks and bleeding into this week is how can we use people's worldviews to connect them to the gospel story? So um, what might be a launching point for your anthropology. What might somebody believe about mankind that we could direct them to the gospel? Yeah, go for a drive around town, try raising children. Um, I mean, my my child is perfect, but I understand a lot of people have issues. Um, he actually doesn't really cause problems yet, um, but he's working on that. Um, anyway, yeah, so if somebody believes that... Um, that man was basically good, um, how might we respond to that with the Christian worldview? <laughs> okay, all right. I'm, I'm glad you say that because we're going to be working on conversation um, at the end of today. Um, you're not wrong. <laughs> okay. So that's almost, that's almost the opposite approach we want to take. Um, but... But we're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. Um, sorry. All right. Okay, so that brings us up to where we are today. Um, what we have been looking at is in Acts where Paul goes to the Greeks in Athens, um, and he essentially does what we're talking about here. He, he starts with a worldview engagement, and then he starts feeding the gospel into the context of Greek thought and Greek life. And eventually he delivers this scheme that we have here, the, the story of the Bible, of what God is doing in the world. 
um, and he gives them a call to repentance. Um, so if you haven't yet, turn to Acts chapter 16. I'm sorry, chapter 17. <clears throat> and we are almost done with this. Um, we're going to read the major portion of it just to um, refresh it in our minds. So who would read chapter 17, verses 22 through 26? Who would read chapter or verses 27 through 31? Who would read 32 through 34? All right. Um, whenever you're ready. All right, so at the beginning of this, um, <clears throat> all right, so Paul is standing before essentially a council. Um, so he's in a similar but different situation to what we're doing at Vita on Monday nights where you're sort of addressing a group of people who don't necessarily believe what you believe um, and you've got to engage them and give them a concise gospel account. Um, what does he use as his worldview engagement hook at the beginning? Yeah, so what's that about? You're going to hope that they share the offering that they give or something. Um, yeah, they're sort of hedging their bets. He also says you're all very religious men. Um, you've got all of these different temples and idols, and you've even accounted for the unknown God. Um, you care deeply about theology. Um, so he engages with that, and then he begins to give an account of um, this is what's actually true about God. And some of it will agree with some of the Greek philosophies that are in those areas. Um, but he's also correcting things along the way. Um, uh, you're getting a few things right. You're getting a lot of things wrong. Let me tell you about the true God. What other areas of worldview does he touch? <coughs> Knowledge? How so? Yeah, um, and actually the, the Greeks, especially in Athens, believed in sort of discovering things through discourse. That's why they were so interested in encountering all these different religions. So by engaging their ideas, and he uses some of their poets in reference, um, he is sort of engaging their idea of knowledge. Um, how do we come to know things? Well, 
I'm giving you a revelation from God, and I think that's how you come to know things. Um, what else does he touch on? All of them are right answers, but you have to say why. There's more. Yes. Um, there was an idea in Greek culture, we've already talked about this, um, where it was the Greeks and everybody else. They believed mankind was split into two categories, Greeks and barbarians. Um, and Paul is correcting that anthropology, that view of mankind, and saying everybody comes from God and originally two people. Um, and so that's the wrong distinction amongst mankind. The real distinction is those who are seeking after a relationship with God, um, who are um, living in the kingdom of God, and those who are not. Um, other things that we talked about. Hey, sorry. Um, I think because in uh, 29 it says that it says that there was one exception in 29. Okay. That was, ag <laughs> that was also aggressive. Um, yeah, that um, the way that we worship, um, it's, it's not virtuous to bring offerings to God. That's not how we, we bring virtue. Um, that ethics comes from somewhere else. Um, but that's also true of sort of the, the, the God-man relationship here. Um, and he corrects this with uh, a view of creation, that God made everything. Um, that he is the source of all life, that he's also sovereign over life, he's upholding life, and he's involved in history. Um, so all of that. All right, so we discussed previously up to verse 28, where we talked about um, Paul quoting these poets. If you remember, um, he's quoting two guys who are talking about the Greek theology of Zeus. And he says, you believe these things about Zeus, in him we live and move and have our being, and for we are indeed his offspring. And, and he's using that to reason from. What he's not saying were, were that these poets were good theologians and they got everything right. Um, but what he is doing is he's saying, you're assuming these things to be true, which is actually only true of God, and you're acting as if it's not true. Because right after that, in verse 29, he says, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Um, so what is he kind of saying there? What's his argument? Yeah. Yeah. So he's saying, okay, there's something incongruous in your worldview. Um, if you remember, we talked about Nietzsche, who said, okay, there is no God, but then how are we going to build the whole infrastructure of, of our lives without him? Um, and he comes up with an answer, not a good one, don't worry, um, I'll just spoil that one for you. Um, but he's saying, um, if we don't start our worldview with God, then how are we going to have things like ethics? How are we going to know anything about mankind? How are we going to know where the universe comes from? And, and Paul is doing the same kind of thing. He knows his enemy well enough to quote him, and he's saying, okay, you're saying things like we all come from the gods. Um, without them, we have no being. And yet you're crafting idols in basically the imagination of man, and you're saying that these things could then be gods. He's saying you're assuming things from a Christian worldview um, because they're helpful for functioning in life, but then you're being idolaters. You're making God in your own image. How could God be in your image if you're in God's image? Um, so he takes what they believe about God and about man and about ethics and salvation and knowledge, and he's saying within that are sort of the seeds of your own destruction. Um, 
he, he's undermining their worldview with the true worldview uh, because it, it doesn't function correctly. So verse 29, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Okay, so he begins with a worldview engagement. He walks them through sort of the creation, fall, redemption, glorification. Um, and, and this is the part where he's talking about redemption, okay? There, there is a way to be right with God. There is a way for a new creation to come about. But you have to repent of your idolatry and you have to start serving the true God. Um, because there is a man, who is that man? Jesus, yes, Sunday school answer. Um, and he is coming back for judgment, um, that there is a, a day of reckoning coming. Um, and so repent and believe, essentially. So he engaged with their worldview, but he gives them the full gospel account, and he talks about Jesus and what Jesus has accomplished, and the hope that we have in Jesus, the assurance that we have through the resurrection of the dead. Um, then what happens? Yeah. Exactly. Um, and really, the majority of people, we get the sense at least, sort of were like, okay, the resurrection of the dead, that was a bridge too far. Um, we're no longer interested in hearing from you, Paul. And they mock him. But some people believe. Now, it's only a handful of people. But would we call this a successful evangelistic endeavor or an unsuccessful evangelistic endeavor? He basically gets laughed out of Athens. How so? I mean, Jesus is the hope of Jesus is the reason he came. Yeah, people were saved, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, it is only God who can save people. It's only God who can change a sinful human heart in such a way that it can come to know God, that it can become a new creation. Um, this isn't up to us. And so when you are doing things like Vita presentations, um, it shouldn't be like, I really hope, you know, everybody's nice to me and agrees with everything I say. Um, all we're doing is faithfully delivering this gospel message. And we want to do it strategically. Um, we want to do it winsomely. We want to do it well, um, if not completely. So Paul gives this outline, essentially, but he doesn't necessarily get into the weeds of everything that Christians believe. But he faithfully um, delivered the good news of Jesus and that people need to repent and believe in him in order to be saved. Um, so it, it's only up to us to be faithful in that. And God will take care of the rest. And there are accounts in Acts where Hundreds of people come to faith. Um, thousands of people across the ancient Near East and in the Roman Empire were saved through the ministry of the apostles. Um, but some towns they went and a few people were saved. That's not a loss. That is a faithful execution of the role of the Christian evangelist, which is all of us, and God working according to his own plan, in his own ways, and in his own time. So successful mission, um, even if he did have to leave Athens. All right, so any questions about any of that? Thoughts, ideas? Okay. Um, I want to talk just briefly about these categories. So Paul engages with the Athenians uh, through their temple to the unknown God or their altar to the unknown God. Um, what are some ways in these categories that we could engage with our current culture? Um, and by that, I mean the world culture versus the Christian culture. Let's start with the first one. How could we interact with the world on theology? Yeah.
Sure. So ethics, you believe things are right and wrong. Um, how is it that you come to know what is right and wrong? Um, and what foundation do you have for those beliefs? Give me something specific in the realm of ethics. What's something maybe that's out there that people would feel strongly about and you could ask them why? Yeah. Abortion. Um, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, but it is one. Yeah. Torturing children. Yeah, stuff happening in the Ukraine or in Ukraine. Um, <laughs> because there's a Christian apologist. That's what it was. All right, simmer down. Yeah. Yeah, so people are going to believe absolutely about something, um, whether it's torturing children. Um, or shelling buses full of civilians, um, or they're going to have views on abortion. You could challenge that. But sometimes it's easier to pick less controversial ones, like even torturing animals. Like, should we torture animals? Probably not. Um, uh, but why do you think that? Why would it be wrong for us to do things like that? Um, Well, so even with issues like that where there's a, there's a range of sort of beliefs on that, um, you're going to be able to come to some point where they're going to say it's absolutely right or wrong to kill an animal. Like, could you kill an animal in self-defense? Most people, almost everybody is going to say yes. There might be – all right, simmer down. So even if, even if you were somebody who didn't believe in killing animals for food, um, but your child's being attacked by a bear – Surely you would think I can defend my own life or the life of my family and take the life of that animal. So you could bring it to some point where they, they are going to have an absolute stance on it. There are some people out there, I would say a very small, loud minority maybe, that would say you should just let yourself be eaten by the bear because that's the balance of nature. Um, then you could say, well, why do you think animals are that much more important than people? What justification do you have for that? So. Whatever side they come on on that issue, if they have a, an absolute view about it, then you can engage with that. So let's say um, they say, yes, you can or no, you can't kill an animal in self-defense. How could you bring that back to the gospel? Why? Why can't you? Yes. Sorry. You can say a, a noise because you're like behind me. Say noise. I might be on the wrong track with this, but if they say yes or if they say no, um, you could always bring up the whole thought. So can some people believe that humans are also animals? Um, why was it okay for the people back in Jesus' time to kill people? Yeah. Um, yeah, why is it okay for people to kill people then? Um, or why are some animals more valuable than other animals if we are animals? Um, there's a lot of different questions that you could go to there. Um, but maybe as less of an argument and more as a, okay, let's redirect it to our worldview. So Paul doesn't necessarily argue with the Athenians in this context. Um, he sort of corrects it. He gives a, a positive from our side. So how might we correct that, that view of the world? Um, that it is better for an animal to kill you than for you to defend yourself against the animal. Yeah. Um. <laughs> ah, probably not. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good way to go about it. So we believe certain things about creation. We believe everything was created by God, but it was created in an orderly fashion, um, and that human beings have a special role in that. 
And you might even throw in something like, I mean, it's obvious that humans have a special role because we're the only ones that can have a conversation about whether or not it's right to kill another animal. No other animal is having that conversation. Um, no other animal is worrying about that. Um, we can actually control our instincts or think outside of our instincts. We can evaluate our own behavior, um, which other animals can't do. Um, but then I would just say, okay, then you have a launching point for the rest of the story there. So we were created special by God, um, but there is something seriously wrong with human behavior. And we do abuse our, the creation that we've been put in in a lot of different ways. And humans are cruel to other humans, but also to animals. And that's because um, the human heart has been corrupted through an original fall. Uh, we think it's, it's the sin in human hearts that causes all these things. And the only way for that to be fixed is how? Animal rights groups. Yeah, no, Jesus. Um, and then you're, you're off to the races. You just shared Jesus. Um, and it's not up to you to, like, convince them of your worldview necessarily um, if you can tell them about the worldview of the Bible. Not in, like, a super aggressive way, um, but just in a way that is faithfully delivering that message. And they may chase you out, or they may be like, we will hear you again about this. Um, okay, so we've been talking about this in the context of sort of a, if you have a large group discussion, um, or if you have some sort of platform from which you can give, you know, a sort of long form, do I? Yeah, so if you get a chance to go before a Greek council, like that's, this is the sort of thing that we're talking about. You want to be engaging with worldview, um, but you're also sort of delivering a, a concise statement about what we believe. But a lot of times in conversations, it's not going to be quite like this. Um, it's going to be more conversational. Uh, so I want to look at another passage to kind of talk about that. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's why conversationally, um, we're about to talk about it's it's best to actually ask people what they think about things. So um, you could ask people, where do you think everything came from? Um, and why do you think that? Actually listen to their response. Um, and then you might be able to then share what you think about where everything came from um, and frame it that way. Or what do you think about mankind? Um, because the the trick is with these things, um, with these worldview categories, everybody does have one. You just have to ask the right question, um, and they'll tell you about it. Um, they may have never thought about it, and that might be their answer, um, but they're at least assuming something to be true in each one of these categories in order to sort of function as a human being. Um, where does the time go? Okay, we're going to run through this because this is we're moving on from this. Um, so flip over to... The book of John, chapter 4. John, chapter 4. Okay. All right. So if you're there, um, we're going to be starting in verse 4. Um, so this is Jesus. He's going around. He's preaching in various places. 
says, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to the town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to drink water, draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands. And the one that you have now is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you said that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming. And is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Okay, and so after this, she says, I know that a Messiah is coming. And he says, I am he. And she goes and she shares the good news about the, the Messiah that's come with her whole village, even though she is sort of somebody who has been under shame in her community because she has been having all these diff different husbands and she's living with somebody who's not her husband. Um, so we have an encounter here where Jesus is having a conversation with somebody. Now, there's differences between Jesus and ourselves, as hopefully we all know. And so um, we can't just like take this and say, this is exactly how we should have conversations. But there are some principles here um, that I think are good for us to have. So. What's the first thing that he does? Um, he does, but that's after, actually, the conversation's already started. He asks for water. He asks for water. Um, so even getting here um, is something that we can learn about. Most people who were Jews would avoid going through Samar Samaria um, because they had no dealings with the Samaritans. They would just go around. Jesus purposely goes somewhere where he's going to meet people um, who are his enemy. Um, that's the takeaway. We need to be looking for places where we can be interacting with people who don't know God. Um, and he starts out by basically making conversation. Hey, can I have a drink? Um, so a principle there that we could learn is you can start off a conversation just with, hello. Um, things that are happening in the world, um, current events, like, hey, what are you doing here? Um, what have you seen that's good on Netflix recently? Um, you can start with just a general conversation. And if that conversation never makes it to the gospel, then worst case scenario, you started a conversation with somebody who might not have been of your tribe, and you just had an inter interesting conversation about Netflix. Um, then what happens? Well, yeah, so they, they've started a conversation here. Um, then he touches on something that's going on in her life. Now, we are not going to have special knowledge about what's going on in people's lives. <laughs> but by asking them about themselves, often you will come up with things like that. Even if it's something like, man, I'm really worried about what's happening in Ukraine right now. Um, or, yeah, I'm here, but I'm having a tough day. Or um, whatever it may be you may be able to engage with their actual life. Maybe not through your first conversation, but um, through subsequent conversations even. Um, something is going on in your life. And he's actually touching on a pretty awkward one. Um, you've, you've been sleeping around. And what does she do in reaction to that? Changes the subject. Um, ah, I see that you are a man of learning. Um, what do you think about worshiping on this mountain or that mountain? 
Um, and he actually answers a, a deeper concern. Um, it, it's not so much about the, the mountains that we worship on. Why? Because there is something that's true now in the world that's going to change the way everybody worships. So he, he gets to a deeper level there, and he answers questions that she has not necessarily asked. Um, so a principle there that I think we could take away is he doesn't get drawn into an argument about these categories necessarily, um, and he actually answers a need that she has. She needs salvation. She doesn't need to know which mountain to go worship on. She needs Jesus. Um, and so he brings her to that sort of thing. Um, an example of this might be um, if somebody is, say you're talking about homosexuality, um, and that sort of comes up. A, a deeper question of that might be, do you think you're better than me? Um, or, um, or do you think that people are worse than other people? Or um, is there salvation for people like that? Um, can we still be friends even though um, I'm doing something that you don't agree with? Um, and the deeper qu answer to that question would be what? That depends. Yeah? Sure. Okay. We've we've gone down a pizza excursus. Yeah, so you might not hang out every day, um, but a, a response could be like, okay, um, so you're in this conversation, they find out you're a Christian, they're like, well, I know that Christians hate homosexuals. Um, you could say, well, actually, what the Bible teaches is that everybody is sinful, um, and that everybody has been equally separated from God. The only way for that to be made right is actually through somebody else's merit. We can't do it ourselves. Um, and so then you get an opportunity to share the gospel and saying, um, no, I don't think that I'm better than you. Uh, in fact, I think that we're all pretty bad. But I do think that there's a way in which we can become right with God and that he can be making us into new creations uh, and that we can actually change our lives through that. Um, and you could give maybe a personal account of how that's worked in your own life. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily want to get into a theological argument if you're trying to share the gospel message. There are times where you have theological arguments, and you may have friends where that's sort of the way that you guys hang out is have arguments. Um, and, and there's places for that. But if, if you're touching on, you know, a life event or a concern that somebody has, and what you want to do is share what saved you from your own sin, um, then the right answer would not be, I'm better than you, right? So, yeah. Right. So, yeah, in the context of sharing the gospel, um, you're not necessarily trying to argue, um, and arguably, you could never argue somebody into the faith, um, but being faithful in your presentation of the gospel can save people because God will work through that, um, and he'll be working behind that and around that. Um, and, and so, in a conversation like that, you want to be asking real questions about what they believe. You want to be genuinely interested um, there's almost nothing more annoying in a conversation than somebody who's just waiting to say their bit. So if you take a genuine interest and you actually hear people, uh, oftentimes they'll want to know what you think about things or there'll be an opportunity for you to say um, something that's true of your own life that's applicable to that. So 
let's say somebody's, I'm having a bad day because uh, my dog died. My dog's fine, I think. I haven't seen him in a few hours. Um, say you're, you're chatting with somebody and you're like, hey, you, you kind of seem down today. What's going on? They're like, well, my dog died last week and I really like this dog. Um, how could you maybe point them to the gospel through that? Simmer down. Simmer down. Everybody's dogs are fine, I think. Yeah. All right. Quiet. Yeah. Simmer down. Simmer down. Yes. I know. I thought you had something. <laughs> I'm not finished. Hey, listen up. It's not going to heaven, but it's not going to hell. You have a soul. It's one of those things. <laughs> okay. Well, I respect your viewpoint. You might say, um, man, this is a really messed up world that we're living in, and a lot of bad stuff does happen. Um, first of all, it stinks that your dog's died. Um, I had a dog that died, and that was terrible. I hated that. And there's a war going on in Ukraine, and we have to pay taxes. And there's so much wrong with the world. Um, but that's actually, that's actually a blessing. Um, but there is something wrong with the world, but there's also somebody who's making the world new. Um, and we can know Jesus through his word and if we come to know him, then all of our sins are paid for, and we're actually being brought into a new creation where there is no death, um, where there is only life. And there's life in a way that we can't even imagine here. Um, and they might be like, well, that's a weird thing to think. And then, you know, you're in a conversation. Um, the point being is that you want to engage with what's going on with people. You want to have real conversations. Um, and in those real conversations, you may be able to touch on just one of these things or just um, a part of one of these things. Um, or you might be able to just be a friend to somebody and through that context be able to share the gospel. Um, but it doesn't always have to be this full-on thing. But knowing this in the back of our minds, this structure and all of these categories can help us to point regular conversations in an intentional way to spiritual matters. Um, and that will become easier and easier if it matters more and more to us. So if Jesus has changed your life in very specific ways. If he has given you hope in sad situations, um, if he is changing the way that you live, then you're going to be able to relate that to other people. Um, so next week we're going to be talking about testimonies, and I'm going to make you all give testimonies. It's going to be scary. I'm just kidding. It's not going to be scary. Um, so we're going to close in prayer, and then we're going to have, like, two-minute prayer groups. And I did it again. I, sorry. Yeah. I know. Nobody set an alarm. Nobody set an alarm. All right. I did not hear it. All right. Um, does anybody want to close this in prayer? Great. All right. Praying.